Dear colleagues, um, welcome um, to the third Knowledge Cafe of the IPPN. My name is Serge Capto. I am policy specialist in the SDG integration team in UNDP. Uh, and I support IPPN along with uh, several colleagues working behind the scene um, from UNICEF, ILO, FAO, and UNFPA, as well as colleagues in UNDP, uh, to whom I give my, my thanks. Uh, a quick refresher, the Integrated Policy Practitioners Network is an initiative of uh, nine founding uh, UN entities to create a community space where we can share lessons and experiences and strengthen our collective capacities to deploy practical applications of integrated policy approaches in support of the 2030 Agenda. The IPPN is open to colleagues in uh, government, academia, and the broader development community. In this session today, we will hear about a new guidance uh, on helping build resilient societies that has been endorsed by the UN Sustainable Development Group and published recently. Resilience is almost by definition an issue that requires an integrated approach. It cuts across all policy domains in the three pillars of sustainable development, as well as human rights and peace and security. It is also relevant to all countries, irrespective of their development context. How do we ensure that a multidimensional approach to risk management for resilience is integrated into UN policy and programming processes at country level? I am very pleased to welcome colleagues from the interagency team that developed the new guidance to discuss the rationale for strengthening coherence in UN resilience building efforts and how the new guidance is being rolled out by UN partners at national, regional, and global level. Uh, Mrs. Angelica Planitz is a team leader for disaster risk reduction in UNDP. She has over 26 years of working experience in uh, disaster and climate risk governance at global, regional, and country levels with a focus on risk-informed developments and resilience building. We also have uh, Mrs. Sylvie Wabes, um, who is an um, agronomist and a resilience advisor in FAO. Uh, with over 30 years of experience, she supports FAO's strategic program on multiple colliding risk and emergencies from disaster, climate change, food chain threats and conflict for building resilient agri-food systems in most vulnerable and fragile settings. We will also hear from Lars Bent, who is a regional advisor for risk-informed programming, climate change action, and peace building in UNICEF's Western Central Africa office. Lars has more than 20 years of experience in technical advisory and convener roles on multi-sectoral, multi-hazard risk management and sustainable development in Africa, Arab states, Asia, and Europe. Um, a note on housekeeping, um, please make sure that your microphones are muted to allow colleagues to hear the presentations. Uh, do use the chat function to uh, ask questions or share your experiences and insights interact during the presentation. After the presentation, we'll open the floor um, for those that wish to intervene. Uh, without further ado, uh, I hand over to uh, Angelica and Sylvie for the presentation. Angelica, I think you're coming first, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Serge and colleagues, for this introduction and for the opportunity to actually present uh, this UN Common Guidance on Helping Build Resilient Societies. Uh, it's maybe not so new anymore, but still, you know, we need to do more to socialize it. And um, uh, anyways, and I'm very pleased also that um, as a representative of the UN Interagency Drafting Team, I can speak to you uh, today together uh, with Sylvie and Lars. And maybe there are a few other colleagues uh, from the drafting team on this call. Uh, so let me um, start with the first slide. Um, so basically, uh, the UN Common Guidance um, aims to achieve three things. One, a, um, you know, a greater coherence to overcome some of the fragmentation we are actually seeing in the UN's um, resilience building efforts. Secondly, it wants to provide, therefore, a system-wide guidance on resilience to deliver on the 2030 agenda. So really, this establishes a link between resilience building and the 2030 agenda. And thirdly, um, you know, it provides a set of shared principles and a common understanding and approach um, in resilience building. Now, the guidance was endorsed by the UN Deputy, Deputy Secretary General last year and also uh, by the UN Sustainable Development uh, Group in September. Next slide, please. 
But this slide here shows um, the guidance at a glance. And, um, and you see, as there's already mentioned, um, it is applicable. So resilience building is a concept applicable across a wide range of contexts in the traditional, if it still exists, uh, development context in a humanitarian protracted crisis context um, in recovery as well as in peace building. And um, really the guidance wants to support UN teams applying a resilience lens in their UN planning processes processes, whether it's the cooperation framework, whether it's the humanitarian response plan or uh, the integrated strategic frameworks. So in that sense, it doesn't really promote to come up with a separate standalone um, resilience plan or framework for the UN, but to really have this resilience lens. And, and also, um, you know, it, it wants to help the UN and its partners to join up its various approaches, methodologies, tools and programs to really link things better together. And of course, uh, last but not least, through this more coherent approach, then also equip governments to integrate a resilience lens in their development uh, planning process. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the scope um, of this guidance, it really uh, covers the three pillars of the UN system. And in that sense, it's considered to be unique uh, by covering the development, the human rights and the peace and security pillars. And it covers therefore a wide spectrum of hazards and threats, disasters, climate, food insecurity, um, you name it, social protection, etc. Uh, but we really also want to emphasize that it is relevant um, very much also in the context of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, overall, the document is guided in four main sections, which I will be presenting um, to you briefly. Um, the first one would be why resilience matters, what resilience is, and how to build resilience together. And there's also some tips on partnering, coordinating, and financing for resilience. So why resilience matters? I mean, actually not only or since COVID-19 already before, but I guess COVID has very clearly demonstrated that the nature of risk and how risk inter is interdependent is changing. Um, and, and we know that resilience building actually pursues a systems approach and, and this can really help to address these interconnected challenges. Um, also why resilience uh, matters is that resilience building has multiple benefits that can go far beyond reducing human suffering or protecting development gains. In fact, uh, resilience building when done well uh, can stimulate economic activity um, and it has therefore great benefit even in the absence of a crisis. So it's like almost a kind of no regret um, solution. We, we, we know that term as well. Um, moving forward to diving into the next chapter of the guidance, um, what, what is um, resilience? So basically, um, for the guidance, it was felt really important that the UN and partners had develop a shared um, understanding um, for resilience so they can really build on, on the coherence or coherent effort. And, and this was particularly felt important because there are so many definitions on, of resilience in use in the UN, but also by partners. So in the guidance document, we are starting with the um, CEB, the UN CEB approved resilience definition in 2017. Um, and uh, during the drafting process in collaboration with these other 18 UN agencies that we as UNDP coordinated, uh, we then boiled um, down four key elements of resilience that are, um, you know, that are featuring in so many definitions and that are key to address um, this systemic multidimensional nature of risk. Um, one element is to have a common understanding of these multiple dimensions of risk, but also the context in which we operate and, and how these risks um, interact at different levels of, of society. Um, 
The second um, element is uh, to, to the importance of pursuing a multi-stakeholder approach so that we are sure that um, the range of perspectives and experiences um, of risk can be considered in the process. Um, thirdly, as I mentioned before, um, key is to pursue a systems approach. So really to understand the adverse effects um, across systems and sectors with their knock-on and cascading effects. And um, as mentioned, COVID is a very good example of such a systemic um, effect. And finally, um, you know, a focus on strengthening capacities for resilience. Now, what are these capacities uh, for resilience? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here you see um, the five resilience capacities. They are adaptive, absorptive, anticipatory, preventive, and transformative. And they can be uh, strategically developed um, as the opportunities on the ground allow, and basically depending on the context and the, and the conditions we see. Maybe in some contexts, it maybe it's possible to work on adaptive and absorptive capacities and other contexts open the room to be more transformative to really see, you know, how can we really reform um, uh, the system um, more, more broadly because it's what we have is not suitable to, to deal with the challenges uh, we are seeing. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is the chapter really on, on what resilience is. The next um, chapters in the guidance I bring them together, chapters three and four is really how to build resilience together. And I'm not touching on each and every um, of those uh, steps, um, but you see that, that they are basically, um, uh, they follow this, the steps for joined up UN um, programming or planning and support of resilience follows a generic planning process. But when you dive into the document, you will see that uh, it provides very detailed uh, suggestions and guidance on how to ensure deep collaboration and, and synergy in each step. Um, and, and, you know, it is really a decision of the respective UN team uh, to commit uh, to working together and, and this decision of course has to be taken collectively and in consultation with the other key partners like the government, um, the donors, IFIs or, or local organizations as well. And, and so there, you know, we really say it's so important that there is this agreement to uh, work together or to coordinate one's actions on resilience building for specific geographic areas across multiple sectors and systems uh, for specific target groups uh, to be able to really um, address uh, the complex uh, situations that we are seeing. So in summary, really the guidance reminds us that the UN um, you know, needs to connect with its partners Often we are a small provider and maybe a little bit inward looking, so therefore we need partnerships. Uh, it also, um, I mean, the feedback we have received is that it's really uh, very helpful to promote strategic and forward planning while at the same time addressing the immediate emergency and development needs. So it provides the space to think long term when there might be a very hectic, um, you know, humanitarian environment even. Um, and therefore it can help overcome um, the humanitarian development peace divide. And, um, you know, it also uh, provides very good tips on, on how to address maybe some of these disincentives we are seeing for joined up action uh, related to, uh, to the international funding architecture that might um, sometimes be a bottleneck for integrated resilience uh, solutions. So, uh, the last slide, very briefly, this is uh, uh, just to raise your awareness that in uh, to accompany the guidance, uh, there is also a learning packet that we have developed. It consists of four elements. We have an infomercial to generate interest and so where to find support. Um, there is also a foundation course that is an individual learning uh, opportunity, which will soon be online available for uh, UN staff and beyond. Um, and thirdly, uh, there 
will also be country level workshops and we have developed already the raw materials for this that are on offer for senior management in UN teams but also technical um, specialists. And we're also really, really happy um, that we could be working with the UN System Staff College to develop a resilience module uh, for the RCO uh, learning path. Anyway, so this is um, the broad overview from my side. Uh, I would like to uh, bring it to a close here and hand over to Sylvie to give a little bit more insight into how, um, how the application of the guidance uh, is progressing in, in FAO. Thank you very much. Thank you and hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm with the Italian coffee at hand. I hope you can join me. I'm based in Rome. It's a an honor and pleasure to be out together to talk about resilience and to unpack it a little bit further, building on what Angelica presented. We've been working uh, together with many of the other agencies on developing and finalizing this guidance. So we, we really see that, and we've learned this from COVID, that crises and risks are touching everyone and everywhere. It is systemic, uh, and it's especially serious for the agri-food system. It's very serious because agriculture by itself and food uh, production, but also the consumption and storage depends very much on the climate. And we know we are in the COVID crisis, health crisis, pandemic. We are in a climate crisis, but also in the biodiversity crisis, um, a pollution crisis. And all together at the national regional level, we are facing also many other uh, conflict, disasters and crises like the locust. Um, and the Horn of Africa is a good example of this colliding crisis and shocks that are happening together and that are making a number of people suffering, uh, growing by the day. Today, together, we really um, have more than um, 161 million uh, people which are suffering from food insecurity and nearly half million, re uh, half million um, suffering really from uh, uh, risk of famine, acute hunger. This is very serious, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. So we are using this common guidance, which is really the one-stop uh, shop, the one common reference for building resilience across these different risks and crises, and across systems, but especially for the agri-food system. We're using that in three for us The climate change and the COP process, where we really focused on the climate risk, climate risk management, where mitigation is an accompanying measures, but the focus is really on adaptation and resilience. And using this common guidance has been informing the Mahakesh Partnership of, on Global Climate Action and its Climate Resilience Pathway, it's been like informing the various um, actors and sectors about mainstreaming risk management, climate risk management, both of shocks and stresses all together. The second, and, and you can find the link on the chat to this um, climate resilience pathway, which is on UNFCCC website. The second big process, and I'm running because we're short of time, is this food system summit. One of its action area is resilience. And again, we use and promote the common uh, guidance on resilience as the basis, the definition for a system approach with these five capacities, a multi-actor approach, um, and the working along the humanitarian development uh, and peace nexus actors. This is informing and at the base of many of the alliances which are emerging and some of these alliances working specifically on resilience. And one is really on climate resilience agri-food system where we're engaged in but also on the HDP Nexus Alliance, where there is really a focus on the conflict, climate, and other uh, crisis in, for countries in food crisis situation. This also should inform the national food system pathways so that make sure we mainstream out the risk management for resilience building. 
The third process is the new strategic framework that we are having in FAO, which is articulated around four better, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life. And we have two priority areas on emergency and resilience, uh, which are again building in and, and welling on this UN common guidance as a common reference for our work in the agri-food system, but also connecting to the other systems and connecting to the other actors working in other sectors. Next, now I'd like to um, go quickly, take a little more time instead of speeding ahead, sorry, um, on some of the really practical elements, uh, Angelica has mentioned the system approach, the multi-risk approach, the multi-actor approach of, of this uh, UN guidance, you know, which is built along um, a program cycle management. And we want to share with you what we've been using in, in going further down the next question. So you need this prevention, anticipation, absorption, adaptation, and transformation capacity. Very good. But what do you need to reach and to secure these capacities? And this is where we're coming with the existing set of tools on risk management. And we have many today. The problem is that many of these tools, not only for the agri-food system, but across other systems, whether it's on health, we've seen it with the COVID, or on transport or infrastructure or energy, these, these are, um, are risk management tools that are often operating in isolation. What we've been doing in FAO and what we are promoting also in the, in the follow-up of the UN Food System Summit on Resilience is the importance of connecting these different risk management tools for the different uh, shocks and stresses so that it brings um, a constellation of tools that are connecting to one another. So for example, if you take the first and the second point, the monitoring of the agroclimatic uh, situation, the monitoring of the disaster crisis risk, the food security information system, together with early warning systems, that drives actionable alerts that can then inform and guide the whole rural uh, risk governance and triggers the, all the, some of the other mechanisms, including the humanitarian response and anticipatory action to a, a looming crisis. But also it should guide the other elements of risk, risk transfer mechanisms, such as social protection that must be shock responsive and risk sensitive, the insurance schemes, all the risk and vulnerability measures that we applied at field level, whether it's on the farm or on the firm, along the food value chain, that really helping to reduce the risk, the vulnerability and impact from shock and stresses. Also driving the way we build our infrastructure, we adjust or rehabilitate our infrastructure so that they become more risk proof to the whole suite of shock and stresses that we face. You've heard about the nature-based solutions that has been very much promoted with the UNSD uh, Climate Action Summit in 2019, which is also a priority area of the Food System Summit, which is putting nature first as your first line of defense. And then finally, something very specific to our agri-food system are the food loss and waste, but also the diets, the way we consume our food, and is this food from a uh, sustainable resilience or close, inclusive um, origin. So with this, I stop here, and I leave you these different type of anchors, whether you are a policy specialist, a data analysis, um, infrastructure specialist, you can all use this different interpoint to connect this suite of multi-risk management for developing the system approach and building these various capacities which are essential for the resilience. Resilience is the only condition needed to really secure a sustainable future. I stop here and thank you very much and looking forward to your question. Back to you, Serge. You are still muted, Serge. 
Oh, thanks. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Angelica. Thank you, Sylvie. Uh, very insightful. Um, I do believe that you had a poll that you wanted us to run after um, your presentation. Yes, uh, that would be really nice. Uh, I think Nadine and colleagues can uh, put it up. So it's just a few quick questions to involve our audience. I am launching the first question now, so I hope you can see it. Yes. Everyone in the audience, feel free to choose uh, only one choice for this question. What do you think, Angelica? It looks like we have a clear winner. <laughs> yes. Yes, I'm just waiting still for a few more people to participate because we just reached 56% of the people on the call. So, but yeah, I think to, to reverse that trend would be hard. So yeah, uh, it seems there is really the issue of exposure and vulnerability to natural and biological, et cetera, hazards. Um, so... Uh, but as well, uh, a good portion of people who find themselves in protracted and recurrent humanitarian crisis. We have a second question. Would you like me to run it as well, Angelica? Yes. Here we go. Oh, also interesting on the first question is actually that uh, there is no more this, uh, you know, development at its best context, at least not among the people who have called in today. <laughs> So this question asks, um, are risk local, national, or regional transboundary in nature? Right, we are also reaching again the 55% of participants now, 60, 61, who, who are um, answering that. So, I mean, this is interesting. I mean, of course, we have been leading you on a little bit with only single choice. Uh, but I think it shows that uh, the majority feels this is now regional transboundary, you know, pointing to this systemic nature of risk, um, how COVID has also shown itself. But I think we should all be very aware that the manifestation of any risk is very much at the local level. And if I can say at UNDP, and I will put it also in the chat, we've just um, you know, done a discussion paper on the governance of systemic risk. And actually the local level uh, provides a great opportunity to, to actually treat or address systemic risk that also has um, regional and transboundary characteristics. So uh, yeah, so, um, the answers are well taken from the audience. Here comes the third question. In your views, how many risk does your country face? Okay, also here again, uh, most, almost 80% of people see four or more um, risks. So again, uh, it again points to the need to have a more comprehensive um, resilience uh, approach, of course. So very good. So thank you, uh, everybody who participated in, in the call. Thanks for your active contributions there. Uh, indeed, a very insightful uh, people's perception of, uh, of uh, uh, the issue of risk and the importance of governance. Uh, I think it was quite, uh, quite interesting as well, as you mentioned, Angelica, the importance of uh, uh, action at local level, although a lot of the people see uh, more risk at global level. I think it may be 
uh, because we were quite facing a challenging global environment uh, at the moment. Um, I don't know if Lars is with us. Um, uh, are you with us, Lars? Seems to have a uh, connection challenges, uh, but uh, we can uh, we can come to Lars uh, when he's able to reconnect. Um, I am. I am sorry. Ah, for, yes, there you are. <laughs> sorry, there, you are. <laughs> there are indeed some some connectivity problems. I hope you can see me as well. Yes. Um, yes, we can great. see you. <clears throat> No, no, thank you for this opportunity um, and inviting me for, for a little statement maybe from the floor. I mean, I think everything has already been said and this poll was also very revealing that indeed there's a, a heightened um, understanding that, that we are, live in a, in a world of many risks. And I mean, uh, just coming from UNICEF, working in the regional office for Western Central Africa, we cover 24 countries. Of course, we have multidimensional poverty all the governance challenges, demographic growth also undermining progress. And then we talk about the three C's, which is conflict, climate change, and maybe COVID or otherwise pandemics, but also additional elements. And I think we have road accidents, we have animal attacks, we have also other anthropogenic um, risks like, like teacher absenteeism. These all um, actually add to a long list of um, of risks basically for the most vulnerable to get services and to, to develop and thrive, right? It's a very protracted situation. And, and the UN Resilience Guidance is in that regard super helpful and important to, to bring us all on the table and basically um, contribute because the, the cake is big, right? I mean, we, we just heard indeed FAO perspective, um, very comprehensive view from UNDP but, but uh, you know, for UNICEF, we have five or six sectors, but still this doesn't give us all the resilience. So, so this open invitation and call really to, to UN country teams and, and outside partners as well to invest in resilience building and have a common definition. And then you still have your own agency perspectives is, is super helpful and important. Um, maybe if you give me one or two more minutes <laughs> just to share from, from UNICEF side, so indeed, similarly to FAO, I mean, we adopted really risk-informed programming as a key change strategy, as we did for climate change and, and conflict sensitivity. In that regard, just recently, over the last uh, three, four months, we have carried out um, what we called child risk and impact analysis. Um, these are, I mean, um, basically risk analysis, um, which, which look particularly into the vulnerabilities of children, meaning from conception until 18 years, um, of course, differential impact, girls and boys. And um, it is not a pure UNICEF affair, but, but we really, I mean, in, in the lead up to this, I invited the, the UNDP regional DRI advisor to present the guidance. He was helpfully involved in the whole process. And, and we also linked up um, where we had um, connectors, for example, in Cameroon with the um, Nexus Working Group. Um, so they have the advantage that, that at the UNCTA level, there's someone looking into resilience. And unfortunately, here in the region, we don't have this everywhere, but we need this. We need a UNRC office commitment for resilience so that this guidance can be applied. Because indeed, I mean, for UNICEF, we focus on our sectors, but we won't look so much into DRM strategies. So this is where we need UNDP, we need other partners, or we need a good, a strong NGO doing that. So, so in that regard, really, um, we, we did the assessments, we invited um, UNCT colleagues to, to um, validate it, to enhance it with their data sets, and basically to jointly in, in sectoral um, working groups, um, working tables to, to focus on risk-informed um, programming action. So I think we are still at the start. This was done in Cameroon, in Central African Republic, in Niger. Now we want to go to Guinea. Please all come and support us in Guinea and maybe in Gabon. And, and hopefully maybe, I mean, we could jointly as, as colleagues um, come to some agreement that, that really every, every UN country team has one resilience advisor and can engage these processes we are, we are discussing today. It, it needs so many voices and hands and then only then we can, we can arrive. And, and I will stop here. Thank you for this opportunity again. Uh, thanks, Lars, uh, for uh, for that contribution. Uh, it really shows that uh, uh, 
this uh, kind of normative framework and guidance is being rolled out actually at, at country level, and that's, that's quite important. Uh, how we support uh, resident coordinators and UN country teams uh, in doing that, uh, I think it's a, a key point um, uh, that we, we want to take forward here. So now I would uh, open the floor uh, for, for questions and discussions. Um, uh, I do note that uh, we do already have some activity in the chat. Uh, colleagues, if uh, you would like to take the floor to ask a question, please uh, um, do raise your hand. Uh, I, I have a question from uh, Khadija. Khadija, are you, um, would you like to take the floor to ask your question? Khadija El Hudi. If not, I'll, I'll read the question. And I think it goes to, um, um, it, it can go to uh, either you, Angelica, or uh, Lars or Sylvie, uh, because it's a, it's a relevant question in the context of COVID that we have today. Uh, uh, Khadija asked, with uh, so many initiatives and global effort to reach resilience, didn't the COVID-19 pandemic show us that we still lack coordination mechanisms to reach it? Uh, in my view, there's an obvious answer, but uh, I think, <laughs> Uh, go ahead, Angelica. <laughs> yes, uh, definitely. I mean, uh, the thing is, um, uh, you know, in principle, I mean, it's really good that we have all these initiatives happening. Um, however, how can we move to the next step? And then when we are working at the country level to really see how to establish the, the right connections between them they actually truly complement each other and build on each other. Um, I guess, uh, you know, rather than running in parallel, how can we uh, have a longer term frame and picture under which we can subsume the ongoing initiatives? I think that that would be an important um, next step. Um, but, uh, but in fact, so the more the merrier, I think this was also the message from Lars. However, it needs to be a concerted uh, effort. And, and this is what the guidance, I think, uh, helps uh, because it reminds us at every step uh, how we can practically um, establish those things. And it really starts, I mean, this, this common analysis of the risk and the context is actually a very important starting point because only then can we, uh, can we really see, you know, where do we start our efforts um, and really push the agenda. And then, you know, um, maybe for a certain geographic area or a certain target group so that our, our inputs don't fizzle out, yeah? Um, and I think especially talking maybe for the UN, if you compare us to the big IFIs, you know, we are maybe resource more resource constrained. So how can we really make sure that we are putting all our eggs into the same basket? And um, maybe some initiatives, you know, over time, we then need to change the focus um, and move on to the next maybe big target or, or the next major group, et cetera, or geographic area. So, so yeah, that's for me, but Lars also has his hands up, I see. Yes, Lars. Well, um... <clears throat> Uh, Serge, I, I actually um, think COVID helped us a lot on the resilience because as, as um, you have noticed, probably, I mean, a lot of UN country teams have come up with um, basically um, an assessment of the multisectoral um, or socioeconomic impact of COVID. So beyond all the, the health impact, which was very well analyzed, of course, by, by WHO and, and other colleagues, um, this socioeconomic, so multi-sectoral impact, I mean, going beyond the pure public health and emergency, I mean, a multi-sectoral emergency um, has been most revealing. And may, maybe we, some had managed very well to document this, others are still in progress. Sometimes it was a bit more prospective than, so I think we haven't done the full complete after action review. Actually, we're still in, 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 this, in the crisis situation, right? But, but on the other hand, I mean, it showed as well that there's this opportunity to get together, to have granularity and, and the same story for NGOs. I mean, we had beautiful work here in the region from Save the Children. I mean, basically documenting the impact on household um, income. I mean, of, of COVID containment measures. Well, that's it. I mean, it gives us a new granularity of the analysis and, and can lead us really far. I think it, it built a lot of consensus that, that this is a thing we 
we, we have to take really serious. Yeah, thanks. Absolutely, um, great point, uh, Sylvie. Thank you, very quickly to add, I'm going to come with one of my favorite two words, shared narrative, shared understanding. We are not there yet. We cannot coordinate unless we really understand the importance of these multiple risks that collide, cascade and interact. The health and the COVID crisis has been taken as a pandemic, as like a new risk coming to the picture. It's not even been, you know, in the sort of disaster risk reduction community, this biological hazard has not been seen as something mainstream, but of course it's among the main hazards that are threatening us, but just that in itself. So talking about coordination, whether it's global, regional or national level, it's very difficult because we're working in silos. We are working with specialists. And here I'm talking to you just even within the agri-food system, where you can say we can be more coordinated. Well, you have the local specialists, then you have the animal health specialists, then you have the climate change specialists, then you have the conflict specialists. But to bring us all together, we're working at this at the moment. And we're having, and Angelica was there with us on the uh, internal webinar, so that we are forging our narrative and understanding and language between the capacities and the risk management action, how all that is working together. First, we have to speak the same language and see that when we're talking about these risks, whether it's industry and transport, some of these are the same type of categories of risk that we have in the agri-food system. So just, just promoting that further, only with that shared narrative language and understanding, we can put it as a coordination and improve our work together. And as you said, Lars, COVID for this has been helping, showing our weaknesses and so showing how we are completely working in silo. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvie. Um, uh, great points there on the, we need, uh, we need a shared narrative, uh, common understanding, and this guidance would help towards that. I see Angelica that you want to uh, come back. Sorry, yes. sorry but, that I want no, to take the floor again. But uh, now that I heard everybody speaking, actually there is, uh, you know, we also need to look at the barriers and the disincentives for a coordinated approach and a more coherent approach. And when we did these consultations to prepare the UN Resilience Guidance, really the, the, the funding architecture was mentioned again and again and again, because the funding is actually not made available often for cross theme, cross sector, cross multi-risk approaches. They are still quite um, coming in, in silos. So, uh, so that I think also is from an advocacy point of view, very important to keep on uh, raising. Thank you, Angelica. Um, I see that the chat is uh, heating up. I'm trying to keep up there as well. Um, there, is a, there was a quick question for you from Khadija. Um, I think we address Khadija's question, um, right? So there's another question from Noura, Moira. Uh, I think this is uh, for Sylvie. Uh, and I think it's, uh, the question is uh, uh, to improve the agricultural sector, we should share the technology such as uh, remote sensor data, AI with all the poor countries around the world. Is there possibility to collaborate for the agri-food enhancement? That's the question. And I think this is about uh, technology transfer. Uh, 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 to, uh, to, to poor countries, I think, to strengthen their capacities to, be, to better address the risk that they face in the agri food system. Um, Sylvie? I'll be very brief. I think this is one of the illustration of the constraint that you were talking about, Angelica, and part of the sharing and the information and how the centrality of this information is driving the governance and all decision making. And, and you're right. Um, the the it, it has to be open, open access, open data, open information, even in knowledge management. We are not strong enough. We're not sharing um, good practices, not enough. And sometimes it's just because it's too complex, it's context specific and so on, but there exist today many solutions that are scalable, including some of the technology. So this is a very good point. And I'm not a data specialist, but I know that FAO has been 
trying to advocate um, for the you know, open data access yesterday in my um, uh, FAO team on emergency and resilience, we had a webinar on um, the all emergency information uh, related data and um, uh, analysis available. And that is becoming for the first time an open access and platform. I, I need to check if it's open to everyone, but I think it is because it's a way, this digital era, it's a way to have all this latest impact assessment, needs assessment, vulnerability assessment, analysis available with some clicks and you can research and have that available for your country. So that should be really be helping the understanding and the managing of these, of these risks, including some of the latest technologies. Yes, so this is coming. Thank you. Yes, we, I, I know that uh, FAO's data is openly available. Um, uh, so that's a uh, great uh, kudos to FAO. Uh, we do have a point uh, from uh, Pius Kube. I think it's a question on how to partner with governments in this effort. So it's, are there examples, it's recommendations from the guidance on how to engage governments? We'll go to either of you, Angelica or Lars. Sorry, uh, can you just, I was just reading in the chat, yes. I'm not good at multitasking. <laughs> how, how, best, how best can we partner with government in this effort? Any examples? I, I think Lars has a... Uh, yeah, has actually, I, I responded to that in, in part. I mean, I refer to this risk analysis, right? I mean, where we indeed informed about the guidance and then... I mean, the intrinsic part is, I mean, whatever we do as development partners or even internal partners is in response, is a support to communities and to governments representing them, right? So, so it is a no-brainer and, and, and this is how, how I think collectively as a UN, we also align, right, with our country programs to be in sync with government programs. I mean, if there's a new three, four, five year government programs, we try to be in sync with that meaning that we have, we have these golden opportunities. I mean, this is a critical window where we, where we can do this analysis, where we can apply a risk lens, I mean, to reach resilience, to improve resilience um, at critical moments, meaning that, that, that we mainstream this, the old term, investing it somehow, I mean, across the board, as it was pointed out by Angelica as well, it's, it's not a boutique program. It, it has to reach all the sectors. And, and the planning for this is when the, when the planning comes to term, for the new for the new country programs, I mean, um, meaning that that this is where you bring the data, where you where you have where you have your risk analysis, which which gives you a certain baseline where you can track against, and and of course this is where you work with government. So for me, that's um, I mean, we of course we we work with communities, but but the for at least for the UN, the normative role, the upstream role. Um, bringing to scale is, is still the, the key component. I mean, NGOs are better working on the ground. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, Angelica? Yes, um, thanks. I mean, in fact, I would more turn around the question because sometimes mm -hmm. it is uh, not a matter of bringing the governments on board. I mean, it's a matter of bringing the UN system on board in a more coherent approach because we now see some governments that are really a little bit tired of this vicious cycle of, you know, uh, hazard, impact, uh, recovery, and then it all starts again. And they were just like, how can we break out of this uh, repetition? And, and this also in some context. Um, um, protracted uh, crisis context. So, so I think sometimes governments are even more, more, uh, more advanced in their thinking and their demand. So how can we really meet that in, in the best way? Uh, but I also just, uh, since time is also flying, uh, respond quickly to a comment from Scott uh, in the chat where he mentioned this issue of, um, you know, the, the interrelationship between humans and the natural world and whether in fact the concept here gives sufficient credit to that. I mean, you know, in fact, when, I mean, I think um, when you look at this concept of, of risk and, and what drives risk, so risk is really driven, um, I mean, that's what we try to educate, by human decisions, by human actions or human non-action. So in that sense, um, you know, when we analyze risk and what contributes to it and what drives it, in fact, that process, if we do it well, would unveil very clearly our role in this process. 
and therefore uh, it should guide us also uh, towards solutions to minimize uh, uh, that role and understand actually what's happening. But I think this awareness is still not there. There is still this perception that the risk, um, well, whatever, it's the natural, it's a hazard uh, or a, you know, it's this, this thing that comes from outside, but in fact, it is very, uh, very closely linked to, to our actions or inactions. So I just wanted to, to mention this and therefore also the importance of governance as a, as a solution um, um, to, to, to resilience and, and risk. Thanks for that, Angelica. I saw uh, Scott's question in the chat and, and I thought that it was uh, a little bit too much to, to read out. So I was gonna give him the floor, but you really uh, answered, uh, answered the question. Um, we do have a question about um, uh, from I think uh, I think uh, a reflection from Katarina Davis on uh, one way to take down silos among specialists is to change recruitment. Uh, still, job descriptions reflect the siloed approach. Welcoming specialists from other disciplines could dramatically open up perspective, and that's actually one of the questions that I had. Because so Sylvie talked about connecting the tools. And uh, I think uh, uh, the nagging question for me is within our own organizations, how do we connect uh, across teams? How do you, uh, colleagues working in resilience, work with other colleagues within your entities uh, to ensure that uh, they are cognizant, they are aware of, uh, of the importance of within their work, uh, uh, integrating resilience. So if you do have any reflection on how you work internally as well, because I. We see that there's a good collaboration across agencies, but within teams, uh, within organizations, uh, is it happening? Sylvie? Yes, this is a very important point. And yes, recruiting and, and bringing in different people um, is very important. And just to also point the, the, the point of, of um, uh, one of our colleagues uh, pointing the role of, of nature and, and system, you know, in, into the mix. We, we are... We are, we are moving to the area of multidisciplinarity. We, we, the, the challenges we are facing are, cannot be fixed by only one type of experts. We really need to blend these, especially with resilience, because whether you take the social, economic, and environmental dimension apart, they have to be brought together. Everything's connected. And our very life is, is the foundation is nature. It provides us everything, whether it's the air, the water, the food, um, the support we, we, we're standing, you know, it's, it's just that all our economy and all our functioning are not giving the right value to these functions, the life support functions or the ecosystem services. So if we add an expert from, for example, from that side or the social inclusivity also, because the equality, equity is a big problem today, together with poverty. If we're bringing these mix, instead of being dominated by economists, I'm sorry for those economists on the, on the team here today, this is vital. This is the way, it's not only necessary for sustainability, but also for the resilience, absolutely. So, so just echoing this further, what we're doing internally in FAO, it's not easy, but with my little team, what we're doing is internal webinar to bring everybody on the page, working you know, on analysis of data, on humanitarian response, on social protection, on cash transfer, on insurance, bringing them together so that we are having this resilience conversation so that we see that the anticipatory action is not the magic bullet. We need to connect with all the rest. And so we are having these conversations, like we're having this um, cafe together today. It's the only way that this triggered the understanding. Once you get that little seed of understanding, then you're moving into the action, searching for more and going into, into those sorts of actions that are needed. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvie. Um, Lars, Angelica, do you want to reflect on that? How do we work internally within our entities, if you do have? Yeah, maybe uh, just to say that obviously, um, you know, there's always room for improvement. However, uh, I think 
what I found really very encouraging is um, UNDP in the Asia Pacific region, for example, when there is a request uh, from uh, a country office to support program development, they are now really making a point of sending um, interdisciplinary teams to cross team um, missions or whether they are also virtual missions uh, to, to support that program development to really overcome uh, to really overcome the silos and I think this is um, this is very good. Also last year, uh, maybe some of you have seen it. We had launched a global consultation on uh, risk informed development, like multi risk informed development, and. Uh, you know, part of this, we also consulted with our UNDP different thematic teams, and we identified which uh, services or tools that they have that can contribute to a risk-informed approach that actually contributes to resilience building. So now there is greater awareness of the various teams, how, for example, a public expenditure review or uh, work on an integrated financing framework or uh, you know whatever it may be, uh, conflict um, analysis actually provides a piece of the puzzle to the broader resilience picture. But you know obviously this is um, you know we're there's more work to be done on. Thanks Angelica. Lars. No, I mean, um, just just one reflection. I mean, some some old time gangsters on the call here will remember um, the old plea from the what was called a global assessment report um, from from UNDRR, UNISDR, when it started off. They they asked basically you have to bring it to planning. I mean, you have to bring this question. I mean, make it intrinsical. Um, a planning issue that basically you cannot achieve your results. I mean, you will you will have so many losses. People will be injured, killed, uh, physically, mentally sick, um, uh, and so hence you, you will you will have to invest very very um, consensually in 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 your planning uh, models. I just refer to that one when we have new government programs, new um, agency programs. And, and, and I think this is, this is really happening now. I mean, at least in our agency, that's how it works. In, in UNICEF, we have very few people working on risk, but it becomes really mainstreamed. And um, we are increasingly also working, I mean, seeing it as a, from planning perspective. So it is not really hosted in our emergency units, um, but it is because then, then very often you, you might be diverted into more response lens, but it, it roofs really to, to prevention. And, and I think this is, this is not only with us, but increasingly in other organizations as well. And that, that gives hope. I, I think, um, yeah, of course, we, we are too late. That's for sure. I mean, uh, I don't know if we will manage. I mean, we have huge, huge challenges, but let's be optimistic. I mean, we are also many people on this call. I think... Uh, a couple of years back, we would not have so many people on the call and we come from all spheres of society, I would imagine. So let's, uh, yeah, nothing more to add. I think we are on a good way. <laughs> Thank you, Lars. I, I would actually connect to this question, the comments that uh, Annalise uh, Stinnenkamp from UNHCR posted in the chat uh, where she uh, says that uh, they're exploring the idea of a partnership and collaborative conversations, interagency uh, and beyond uh, to inform risk management in displacement. Um, and uh, we are running out of time. Uh, we're getting to uh, close to the end. So there's uh, two questions uh, that I would connect actually um, uh, here. Uh, uh, there is uh, uh, the question from, um, uh, let me see. Uh, I think there was a question on how to engage grassroots communities um, uh, that I would connect uh, also with um, uh, the points from, uh, from Joshua on how to strengthen capacities at subnational level. Um, uh, if you do have any reflection on that, uh, if there's any provision or support provided to uh, 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 civil society organizations, grassroots organizations to engage on, uh, on resilience and what sort of uh, uh, resources are made available to strengthen capacities at some national level. Turning to you, Angelica. Um, the question of how to reach out to, to the local level um, uh, to bring them in. I mean, basically, uh, this would be very much uh, during this, um, uh, what in the resilience guidance approach is mentioned, the multi-stakeholder uh, multi approach. 
So it is to really reflect the various perspectives um, of uh, government, but also non-government actors. So it's really how do we use, let's say, um, uh, analysis or needs analysis or findings from, from the NGO sectors in uh, looking at the broader picture providing opportunities for for discussion and sharing perspectives so you know uh, nobody says it's it's a quick and dirty process so the more time you take and, and there was also the feedback of course um with the resources that we have is it feasible to go uh, through such a process and i mean the answer is just like you know there's lots at stake so you, you can do a, uh, a smaller process using, you know, consulting with fewer people, using fewer um, information and analysis, etc. But, you know, you will not probably get this uh, broad outlook, this long term approach to resilience building that you wish for. So, so it's really important to engage and to see this also as a process. Um, you know, this is a long term uh, endeavor. It's not a four year programming horizon thing by at the end of which we're achieving resilience. So there is an opportunity to bring stakeholders on board um, um, over time and to integrate their perspective and to give them a platform because, you know, risk, etc., is very much an issue of economy as well. It's like who is at the table, who decides of where resources go and at whose backs we can, um, you know, advance development and, you know, by creating many more risks for certain parts of the population, etc. So we need to bring these people on board. Thank you, Angelica. That sounded great for final remarks. Uh, I'll turn to uh, Sylvie for 10 seconds, final points that you'd like to make, if any. Thank you for organizing this cafe and hoping we have many more so that we can really progress together in dealing with all these cascading colliding crises that are going to touch and are touching everyone everywhere, rich and poor, especially the poor, they are on the front line. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvie. Uh, Lars, 10 seconds. Sorry, I, I was a bit overwhelmed uh, also responding to the chat. No, 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 nothing to add from my end. Um, I just typed a few more points there, also gave a link. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Over to Angelica. Thank you, Lars. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you, Sylvie. Um, uh, that was a, a great conversation. Uh, thank you all the colleagues for the lively discussions in the chat. Indeed, there was a quite a, a rich uh, conversations happening in the chat, a lot of comments. Uh, I do invite you to, uh, to stay with us uh, in the IPPN to continue these conversations. So I hear the call, Sylvie, will try to engage more and create this kind of space where we can, uh, we can exchange these experiences and resources. On the slides, you have to link to the IPPN. Uh, you only need to remember one. It's the first one, stgintegration.undp.org slash IPPN. Uh, from there, you can reach out. You can reach all the resources that we have and the other spaces that we do have. We do hope that we'll be able to continue this kind of conversation. I will have another conversation in about a month, our next Knowledge Cafe, where we'll be looking at uh, some experiences in Africa on uh, how to integrate uh, the 2030 agenda and all the global, global development agenda into national development planning processes. And I think it's also an issue uh, that's quite relevant for, uh, for the resilience community because those are issues that need to be part of uh, uh, those action plans that countries have on, on how they implement sustainable development. Uh, with this, uh, Thank you for uh, your participation. Uh, and again, thank you to our great speakers for, for this. Uh, the, this Nuresh Cafe is, uh, is now over. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.